you can't credibly deter war without superior technology. And this has happened over and over, not just in the United States and not even in modern history, but going all the way back into ancient history. Unfortunately, America's defense industrial base, which one produced technology that was far beyond even what we imagine in science fiction, has largely stopped innovating, especially when it comes to systems that actually get fielded, that actually get deployed, that get out of the lab and into major budgets. Uh, and despite spending more money than ever on defense, our military technology for the last few decades has largely stayed the same. There's more AI in a John Deere tractor than there is in any system that the US DOD is fielding. Uh, there's better computer vision in your Snapchat app. And until 2019, the United States' nuclear arsenal was still operating off of floppy disks. But at the same time, China and Russia and other smaller states have sought to seek asymmetric advantage by aggressively modernizing their armed forces, taking advantage of technologies that were developed for the consumer sector, that were developed for business applications, and applying it to their military technology. They've been spending their resources not just to outbuild us on things like ships or outbuilding us on the number of aircraft, but also on things that are going to have an asymmetrical advantage, things like jamming our communications link, degrading the way that our current systems work, and creating armies of cheap autonomous systems that are uniquely suited to going up against our very, very expensive, exquisite systems that cost an enormous amount of money per shot. And the result of this is that today, in almost every war game that the United States simulates against China or their proxies, the United States, if we don't lose, certainly end up in a very, very bad situation. And of course, it wasn't always like this. Silicon Valley itself was founded by patriots who are pushing science and engineering forward, specifically with a mind towards the national interest, not just profit, not just making money, but also making sure that their country actually remained as it was so that you could have future economic growth. War research and development was what turned futuristic dreams into household staples. Personal computing, GPS, the internet, commercial air travel, and so many more things were born of military investment that was later commercialized. In, in 1947, half of Stanford's engineering budget came from the Department of Defense. Just think about how incredible that is, that you'd have a university like Stanford would have so many of their brilliant minds focused on that to the point where it was the majority of the research and development that they were doing. World War II and the 50s were really a golden age of this type of investment. Defense innovation, government efficiency applied to these types of technologies. We built the Pentagon in 16 months, we completed the Manhattan Project in three years, and we put a man on the moon in under a decade. In the 50s alone, we built five generations of fighter jets three generations of bombers, two entirely different classes of aircraft carriers, nuclear-powered attack submarines, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles, just to name a few. And that's why in 1960, the Department of Defense accounted for 36% of all research and development in the entire world. But starting in the 1960s and moving into the decades that followed, our defense industry became more focused on process than progress. Unlike many of our other industries that have continued to rapidly advance in recent decades, defense companies are rarely asked to innovate as a matter of survival. Instead, they build the specifications that instruct them what they are going to build. And because defense firms are reimbursed by taxpayers for every hour they work, well before they built a working product, they're incentivized to come up with things that cause work to be done rather than making things that actually work. Because of that, we now have a defense industry that spends a measly 1% to 4% of revenue on internal research and development, IRAD. And you can compare that to modern technology companies that need to move quickly, that need to invest in their own products, that need to build the things that they know are going to lead into the future on their own dime, spending as much as 20, 30, even 40% of their revenue on internal research and development. Uh, Anderol is currently spending over 50% of our revenue on research and development. Uh, so we're pretty great. <laughs> but you know, the, the result of this disparity, this result of this difference between how our private sector technology companies and our more defense-focused companies work is that we have an aging and top-heavy heavy industry that moves very slowly because that's the incentive structure that they've been given. Uh, it moves slowly because not that many people are actually chasing it. And when I say not many, I don't mean by people, I mean by corporate entity. There's certainly an enormous number of people working in those top few firms. But the 10 largest defense companies in the United States account for over 80% of the industry's revenue. 
I don't think there's really any other industry where you would see anything like that unless you chop it into really, really small slices and how you define it. Uh, nearly two-thirds of major weapon system contracts in the United States have just one bidder. One bidder means that nobody else is even trying to win the money. How can you have competition and how can you have innovation when you only have one company showing up to build something? Understandably, most engineers and a lot of founders in the United States don't want to work under these conditions. Engineers want to see their code deployed, their robots in motion, their products out in the world making an impact, and they don't want to wait years or even decades for that to happen. As a reminder, this conversation was part of A16Z's American Dynamism Summit in Washington, D.C. You can find the full library of videos from the event in November by going to a16z.com slash ad dash summit.